pre-show segment of TNT. So um, based on some of the feedback we've uh, received in previous programs, uh, we're just going to do what we call pre-show chatter. Um, so many of you may be interested uh, to know when the museum is considering reopening here in Whistler. And we're looking at the latter part of June. Uh, our opening will be a staged uh, circumstance for the most part in the fact that um, we'll open Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the first uh, four to six weeks uh, as we adjust to the new circumstances of coming to a museum. So uh, we'll be making an announcement, I would say, within the next 10 to 15 days of when that's going to happen. Um, and when we do reopen, uh, the National Gallery of Canada has been kind enough to, I can't see anything here, um, has been kind enough to uh, extend the extended moment. Um, thank you. Yeah, there we go. This is why we show up early. So we get all these technical glitches. So the National Gallery of Canada's extended moment exhibition, 50 years of collecting photography, uh, will be on at the museum when we do reopen and will stay up through the fall. So this is a, uh, an extension of the show. And uh, I must uh, do a shout out to Sasha Suda and making that available for us because it's an excellent show with uh, both contemporary and historic photographs that date back to the mid 19th century, right to the present. And it's very international in the fact that uh, we have artists from Europe, from Asia, from North America represented in uh, a fantastic exhibition. Some other great news here at the museum in terms of our online effort. Uh, our shop is online now, so go to odaneartmuseum.com and click on shop and you can virtually travel through our shop. And you can also make an appointment with our shop manager, Sonia, to do a virtual tour. So we've got wonderful product there, art-based. My Sean Hunt t-shirt is something that you can get in our shop. And we'll also have other such products from Emily Carr Umbrellas to Group of Seven Mugs. So um, also based on some of the advice I've received recently, I'll try not to move around too much tonight. Okay, so before one last little uh, thing, just to let you know, the success of this show is going to spawn a second season. And that second season is now in the planning stages and that will run uh, from January through February every Tuesday night. So um, thank you for supporting us. All right, let's do this. We're gonna get off the ground and welcome. Okay, so I should appear big on my screen, is that right? There we go, fantastic. Okay, welcome everyone. This is the fourth episode of Tuesday Night Talks here in Whistler, British Columbia. Tonight, we've set a, a new registration record with over 375 people registered, so thank you. And tonight, we're back inside the museum, as you can see by the flashlight glow during this period of closure here, uh, and we're in the permanent display galleries. And tonight, we have a, a wonderful piece that we're going to talk about that is just behind me here called Pearl Body of 2015. Uh, and this is by Liz Magor, and it was purchased uh, through the generosity of the O'Dane Foundation. So now we have the wonderful pleasure of traveling over space and over time to Liz Magor, who is in her uh, residence on Cortez Island in the Strait of Georgia here in British Columbia. Hi, Liz. Hi, I'm just looking at something there. Uh, uh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you tonight? I'm excellent. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Liz has prepared uh, a series of works that are going to really give us some context for this piece, Pearl Body. So I'm going to hand the, uh, the Zoom broadcast over to you now, Liz. Okay. Okay, um, 
we're going to show you some images of work that relate to the work that's right beside Curtis that started tonight with the piece called Pearl Body. So I chose some work that's a few years before Pearl Body and a few years after Pearl Body to talk about, uh, uh, to talk about why Pearl Body exists, let's say, or why I made that. So before Pearl Body, I had been working with um, garments and clothing and um, things that humans, that people um, acquire and use and discard and the kinds of things that are pretty average and pretty normal and, and we go through them at a fast rate. So the first work or one of the works that um, uh, benefited from that drive that we have to have new stuff and use it and then throw it away is this work called Being This. And it's made up of about 70 boxes of, of little portraits in, in, they're in boxes that are about the size of a, a, a shirt box that you would get if you went to Hudson's Bay and you bought a shirt, they would put it in a pretty box like this. So next slide, please, Justine. So each box has a kind of collage that I made from mini garments. So this would be made from several blouses, some fabric from another blouse, and um, the circle is made from some tulle, that's a see-through sort of fabric, and some little jewels that I found on, on a garment, and I put them in eye, for eyes. And if you can look closely, you'll see that the sort of the beak Kind of looks like an owl and the beak is just a label i think it's a i think it's a size label that you find at the back of your back of your shirt and it's in this little collage is um positioned in a shirt box with the wrapping paper that kind of white tissue that that is for package for for when you buy something okay how about the next slide and so I'm just showing three of the 70 plus, but in every case, there's sort of a conflict or a crash between styles and textiles and identities and ethnicity and origin and source. And, and there's often a sort of a shadow of a hand that's pointing at something. It's usually pointing at something that doesn't really help you in terms of trying to identify what this character is. So in this case, um, the finger is pointing at a button that I got from Tom Dean. He's an artist in Toronto. And he made these little buttons that talked about um, despair. And it just says hell. So if we see the next slide. And in this case, this is a, a collage again of several different kinds of garments. There's a slightly sort of older look of a, a different era of an Asian garment and then the, the glove that's telling you about it about itself is just pointing at the size I think it says extra large and the pocket of course is just sort of anomalous and let's see the next slide Ooh, okay we're already on another topic so those three um, those three garments that are in being this, they're the closest to date in, that was 2012, that I got to dealing with the human figure or the, the body because um, the human body and its representation, the human body and its fact is um, beyond knowing. And the human body in representation is sometimes so um, powerful or significant that it, it overwhelms other things I want to do. So I, I generally keep it out of the picture because what I'm wanting to do is not really talk about humans, but to talk about material and to talk about how humans are material, that, that our body is just material, but also how humans um, uh, use material and uh, augment their identity with things and material. And so, the boundary between a human body and the things that 
address it or entertain it or um, look at it, that boundary is very fluid. And so I can easily make all my sculpture just dealing with objects um, with this very strong undercurrent of it dealing with um, subjects. So, in, so after being this, I made um, works that still use that hand. I was using the hand as um, an active part of the body. It's almost like a voice because of the way it will express. Or in being this, I have it speaking by pointing, so it's directing you towards something. In these works, I'm gonna, I think I'm showing you two or three of these works that involve um, a cast glove. And then the glove is in a, it has an action that I've assigned it to, uh, I've assigned a job to the glove and the job is to comfort or protect another thing that is material. And the other thing is a bird, a dead bird. These are, these were live birds once and they're skinned. They were given to me as um, their antiques. Uh, I think the birds were collected. They had little tags on their legs that said collected in 1908 in the Yucatan. So I had this small collection of birds and um, I make a glove that's very um, compassionate and the glove holds the bird and then the glove and the bird are protected by a sort of a plastic bag. So there's kind of a combination of retail care and human care in this situation. Uh, so we'll see the next slide. This also is the same, same relationships. There's a cast glove, it's slightly different. There's a dead bird that was real and was alive, but maybe a hundred years ago. There is a sort of a film of plastic that protects it. And both of them so far have been on top of these boxes, these um, boxes that are cast, they're sculptural, and they are, they are acting as plinths or shelves for this mise-en-scene or this um, little scene. Um, and maybe in this one, I can talk about the fact that uh, retail care, I just, uh, uh, retail care or retail as, um, uh, as a, a form of interpersonal relations um, mimics real interpersonal relations. So retail doesn't really care about us, but it acts as though it cares about us. And so I, I find it easy to conflate the two because the, um, the signifiers are very similar. So let's see the next one. Okay, birds are gone, but the idea of the box being the plinth and the um, little sort of subject, I'll call it a subject now, even though they're not subject in the way I'm a subject, but these things that are standing in for the subject, um, now it's um, turned to be um, a small stuffed toy. This was a small stuffed, sort of a dachshundy kind of thing. You might've seen it at Ikea because it was in the kids department. It had a really long nose, which I'm not showing in tonight, but in, if you're looking at the sculpture, you get to go to the side and see it's got a big long nose that's sort of pushed right up against the wall. So this sculpture is hanging on the wall and the subject or the main figure in the sculpture is not looking at the viewer. It's, he's got his back turned, his nose is at the wall and he's somehow developed a sort of autonomy or a, a kind of a, a an attitude, let's say. So he's on a, I'm going to do a little demo now. He's on a cardboard box. No, he's on a, he's on a sculpture of a cardboard box. Mm -hmm. And so those works that I just showed you are, I start with something like this, just really crappy. And then I use a kind of a casting material that's part plaster and part mm -hmm. um, resin. And uh, I, I do a lot of things, but to put it very briefly, I pour that casting material into that space and then peel the box off. So this is acting as a mold, very quick mold. I peel the box off and I'm left with this solid sculptural form that I can 
create a back to it, a hanging device, and I put it on the wall, and then it receives um, these small vignettes that I that I compose with the glove and the. Um, let's go back to that dog, and now that you've seen that the box, how how that sculptural component came to be, even those bands there. That is where the casting material registered that there was scotch tape or sticky tape in the box and um, the wrinkles and everything. And then I've got the, um, the subject or the figure sitting on a little piece of bubble foam or some sort of foam. So I'm continuing this idea of retail and packing as being um, a form of um, care, a form of gentleness, a form of protection, a form of um, uh, concern that is dedicated to objects and not dedicated to people. So let's see the next uh, image. I think there's another dog coming up. Um, this is a close-up, so you should imagine that there's a, or you can see there's a portion of a box. It's the same story with the box. There's even some cardboard that's left stuck. So when I pulled the cardboard away from the cast, I couldn't get it all left. I just left that evidence of that real world um, in the sculpture. And then I found one of these kind of plushy, nummy, nummy little sweetie plushy toys that is meant to uh, respond to your tactile desires. And I, curled him up. Again, I put him his back to the viewer and I painted him with really iridescent bird-like colors. So he's got many colors and he's sort of enhanced. So in a, in a way, for all these works, I'm taking things that are shitty, that are crappy, that are a very low level production, very low level um, imagination, not very not very well conceived and they come and there's masses of that stuff and it comes into the culture and it races through us like fat through a goose and it goes out and we hardly even notice it and so every once in a while i've gone in and i've fetched one of these hasty things out of the stream and i've i've um uh enhanced it I've appreciated it. I've tried to see its value or I've tried to uh, pause, I've like pressed pause so that we can look at this thing. And, um, and in the process though, I've said, let's not um, look into his eyes exactly. Let's leave that toy, who's now a sculpture, and the sculpture is carrying the weight of what I've been talking about. Let's keep it away from us so that it's not submitting to our needs um, the way most material has been organized to submit to our needs. So in a way I'm kind of um, negating the human in favor of the non-human, which makes those three figurative works all the weirder since they have the, the human figure. I think there's one more little dog um, next in the next slide. Um, yeah, so this shows you, and this is the only side view I've, I'm offering you, but if, if you were in the gallery, you would see the side view and you would walk around. This is the beauty of sculpture is that it has different um, aspects and you don't see them unless you um, want to see them. So they're not just, it's not, it's not a presentation, it's more like um, an interference. And so your body has to come in and deal with that interference and and go to the side and go to this side and go to that side so there's a that sounds like um an unnecessary uh, demand but um my interest is in our relationship with the material world so i have to keep that interest when i'm making work i have to keep that value and that interest um acting at every level of everything I make. So it's not just at the level of concept, but it also has to be at the level of, of how you view the work. So this just shows um, how obstinate the image is um, in not wanting to 
be for you. This image is not for you. Um, okay, let's see the next one. So now we're getting into these body works that were hard to make, and there's only three of them. And I hope by now you understand why they're hard to make. Um, they're hard to make, but I'll say it again. <clears throat> they're hard to make because the human figure is already us. We are humans and the figure represents us. And so in that um, closeness to our consciousness and the activity of our imagination, um, it's hard to uh, have any separation from the sculpture. So, so because we identify with that image, uh, we probably don't identify with the pink dog, um, even though I'm putting it in a certain position. So anyhow, I thought I would try. And um, okay, second demo comes now. Um, uh, because what I was seeing, when I was looking for the little stuffed dogs, I was also seeing uh, weird little humanoid figures of all sorts. I have two here. And so I kind of looked at them. Usually when I see them at Value Village, they're just all in a big pile. Um, but you can see that when they're manufactured, there is some attempt to put a narrative to them and they have they have uh, possibilities, let's say, narrative possibilities. So I kind of, like this guy would be good. I don't know if I would keep his big ears. I probably would tone those down. But I sort of like his pointed toes. So I take figures like this. Here's another one. This one I was just showing, this one to Curtis. I just found these recently. And I, I was showing Curtis how I would <clears throat> expose the legs. I have to take her dress off. And then I saw that her feet were already broken off. Like she's a porcelain dog, I think. And her feet were crashed somehow. I'm not sure how. Um, but she, she can still do this job I want, which is to be, an, be a body. I just want these things to be bodies. I don't want them to be people. I don't want them to be girls and boys or, you know, from from the east or from the west or from the north or from the south. They're just bodies. And, and in that, in that they, they have the, this problem, which is that, that bodies are material, are subject to material degradation and assaults of all sorts. And then it, these human bodies carry these big, bloody imaginations and and thoughts that uh, there's a disparity there i won't say too much more okay let's see the next slide um so this is the one that's that's right beside curtis in his um in his introduction um and so it's the second one i made and in this case um i put a little more expression in so the hand is really important to me the hand is sort of feeling its way uh, to holding on to the box. The box is what I've already discussed, is made that way. And so this is a relationship between this past form of the box that brings things to us, packaging that brings stuff to us, and the thing that might be in the box, which is then uh, forming a different relationship with its packaging. And so the packaging material also serves as a sort of a nesting or like a pillow or um, something like that. Let's see the last one. I mean, the next one. My last one, I mean, it's the last figurative one I did and the relationship is different. The box is smaller, the body is bigger. The grip and the grasp of the body, the body's a bit uglier maybe. Um, and it's having more of a struggle to get onto that box. So it's a bit more desperate. But it's still, for me as the artist and, and um, as a person who's making sculpture, which is objects and material, uh, my interest is in the relationship of that figure to that support thing. Um, okay, I don't remember what comes next, but let's see what comes next. Oh yeah, yeah okay. Um, so these are in chronological order. So I, I kind of am thinking and I do those bodies and then I do the next thing. I've left quite a bit out, but after those little bodies and the gloves with the birds in it, I scaled up a bit. So the cardboard box now becomes like a big package 
and it becomes really the object of fascination for the subject that used to just be sitting on top. So now they're in this cot, they're in this permanently uh, enforced relationship of this beautiful box. It's, it is beautiful, as a sculptor, it's beautiful. It's sort of cast in a silvery, there's a lot of silver pigment and it's silvery. And if you can walk around at the silver, it's got a lot of allure. And all of these ordinary crappy materials and these really degraded, not very great figures, I use a lot of alluring and nice, and beautiful and shiny colors. And this is all in this interest of, of, of bringing them up uh, to keep them, to hold them for longer because they're garbage, really. Let's see the next one. Okay, this one. Um, same little toy figure. And this time I've given him a bigger job. He's on a big box. Can you see he's, he's uh, positioned on a big box that's acting as a plinth. And he's holding um, a jacket that's been used. And it's a Molson's, it says Molson's on the label, uh, on the outside. But the inside, if we see the next slide, the inside is um, the label inside and it says McKee. So it belongs to somebody named McKee. So I, and inside the, we call this inside the jacket were all these um, homemade um, uh, pockets so that whoever McKee is, whoever his first name is, and he's a delivery man from Molson's, I, I gather, and he's probably lives in Vancouver because of this label he keeps all his invoices and delivery slips in here so this is i love this jacket because this is what i'm i've been talking about is this relationship of a person to the material that's available and this person has valued this material in a different way than most of us most of us i think value material for its appearance and this guy is valuing it for its action and so this work gave me the idea of making um, the uh, toys be more like agents and be more active. Um, so this is just a close up of that work. There, there's a lot I would say about this work, but I won't do it right here right now. So um, let's see the next slide. Yeah, so if I say that that jacket being an active agent. So I'm gonna call the jacket an active agent. It means that my toys can be active agents and do a bit more than just stare at the wall because the ones where they're looking at the wall, they're sort of, it's a very passive aggressive position. So in this case, this one's a bit humorous, but um, I have other works around this time that I'm not showing right now where the toys are, um, they have thoughts, they have needs, they have, goals they have desires and in this case i imagine them both falling in love with something that is like them but not close enough so two fake furry things and two fake furry things and unfortunately the two boots are actually supposed to be together so this is a sort of a narrative of a fairly screwed up um quadra love affair let's say again on these cast boxes. Okay, let's see the next one. So this is a bit of a jump, but I'll, I'll say a few words that will make it clearer. The beauty of, of, so my sculpture is this long part here with the boxes on it. The space it's in is a house in, in San Francisco called the, is 500 Cap Street or the David Ireland House. And David Ireland was an artist who lived in San Francisco um, he was born in 1930 and he died about 10 years ago. So he was around a long time and in San Francisco he was a um, very uh, benevolent and loved figure. And the important thing about him as an artist is that he, he bought this old house in the Mission District. Again, the Mission District is sort of groovy now, but when he bought the house, it was, um, the, the house wasn't wanted, it wasn't in a good neighborhood. And he, he used the house, the house was his artwork basically. So in a way he's doing, he's thinking the way I'm thinking where you take something that's unloved, you, it's easy to find 
value in things if if you go slowly so if you take something that's unloved you pause the value just starts to emanate and then you deal with that value and you um you appreciate that value so he did that all through the house in this case he had taken all the wallpaper off all the molding and he put this heavy heavy uh shiny coating on all the walls and over time that coating turned yellow i guess it was a polyurethane so i was invited to exhibit there and i made this work for that space and i made a work that just barged right through his sitting room and his living room and it's a platform and if we see the next slide you'll see what i've put on the platform so on the platform are about 30 pairs of shoes that have been housed in boxes. All the boxes were made by me in the studio. Um, the shoes are not changed at all. The shoes have been collected um, over time at a place, a place like Valley Village. And so I go, um, I would go every Tuesday for six months and every Tuesday I would look at the shoes um, and I'm looking for something that I can't I don't articulate really. I'm look at. I'm willing to respond to just basic um, impulses, um, and so I would buy two or three pairs of shoes a week until I had thirty pairs, um, and then I spend quite a bit of time either with friends or people helping me in the studio to make beautiful boxes for them. So the next two slides, which we can see, show that the whole um energy of this of of the artist in this case is simply to house these not very um precious pairs of shoes none of these shoes are collectible special um vintagey um they don't belong to my mother they're not my grandmother's they didn't belong to any children i know they're just nothing they're they came onto the market for um in response to some style or some drive that I'm unaware of, and they entered the market. They might have been taken up by somebody who wanted them for a while, but uh, ultimately they were discarded way before they're worn out. And so I've just decided to slow down the trajectory of these things to the garbage and just hold them for a second. The next one will be the last um, picture of that work. This one's a bit harder to see because these are fancier boxes. So the box down here with the pink, it's got this reflective pink, beautiful, beautiful paper. This one has these funny little fans. And so um, it's, I made these boxes um, or directed them that they be made in the spirit of the um, Michael's craft store where you buy, you buy all these glittery, sexy things again really cheap shit and um people do their scrapbooking and they make their cards and i kind of am interested in that um drive for decoration without huge resources and and in that drive for decoration when you don't have huge resources you overlook the cheapness of the material because something else is coming and so I'm thinking about that aesthetic world when I made this piece. So in a way, this is, I think, the last slide. In a way, this piece is very similar to the first um, set of images that were of the garments um, that have been reorganized to be more expressive. I think that's well, all. Yes. And yes. thank you so much, Liz. Uh, just that value of the mundane is is now very clear after your explanation. Uh, I really enjoyed the fat through the goose in terms of an analogy. And um, so it, it really gives us some great insight into pearl body. So at this point, uh, we're going to move to the, the question and answer uh, phase of the program. And we, the first question is coming from Trish in Pemberton, British Columbia. Um, and she asks, what aspect of your art making do you find the most challenging with regard to catalyzing your growth? Okay, um, I think something that I have to, uh, that, that I struggle with, and something that I don't think I've always find a solution for, 
is the fact that as I'm using things that are older, um, they're very prone to um, uh, nostalgic drive and sentimentality. And so um, nostalgia and sentimentality are my, I'm interested in them. Uh, but that doesn't mean I want to replicate them. It doesn't mean I want my work to operate on principles of nostalgia and sentimentality. It's more that I want to analyze those those feelings or those those allures or the allure of the of the old, the allure of the ruin, the allure of something that isn't now. And so that's a challenge because I want to make work that's thinking about time which includes the past, um, but I don't want to succumb to the romance of the past. And so um, if it was a longer talk, I would show you different um, instances of where I've, I've wanted to tweak something so that it stays alive and pertinent because sentimentality for my definition of sentimentality is it's when a sentiment or a feeling has been repeated so many times it's emptied out of its of its value of its strength so i don't want to do that no artist wants to make work that is empty emptied out maybe somebody does but i don't know who that is and likewise with nostalgia it's a bit easy to get a reaction with nostalgia so I need to I need to manage those forces while still staying very very close to them. So I always feel that I'm on the brink of corny or schlocky, and I need to stay right on the edge of that. So that's that's my problem. <laughs> and one that you're working through quite well, I might add. Um, the next question comes from Jill in Calgary, Alberta, and she asks, "What advice?" would you give to emerging artists today? Right, well, given that I emerged 50 years ago, um, a lot has changed in the world since, since I, uh, uh, I was an emerging artist. So my comments have to be fairly general because I know that there's material differences for young artists now. I know there extremely different material interest for young artists. But maybe the thing that artists uh, need to do to survive is to um, identify their values right at the beginning. And that's not easy because you have to sort through the values that are being offered to you by the culture. Even the values that are being offered to you by the art world, they may not be really what you um, would stand up for and so I think young artists and artists always have uh, managed to continue to be artists for a long period of time because they identify their values, they think about them, and then they enact them in their work so that they're, they also are playing a long game. So they um, are planning to do this for a long time. And it's based on this, um, this interest or this need to um, to uh, bring these values into um, the world and have them visible. So you have to know what you care about. And I don't think you learn that by looking at art magazines or you almost don't learn that by going to art school. You certainly don't learn that by looking at contemporary art daily online and looking at what other artists are doing. You learn that by looking at your relationship with the world and other people in the world who are varied and sometimes horrible and you look at that you look at that and and so that's that's the most i can say with the big and i say it's the big difference between the world i emerged into and the world young artists are going coming into now well thank you liz that's very helpful advice and we've uh received a question that's come in immediately during the course of your discussion uh it comes from an anonymous viewer but he wants, or she, or they, want to know, what are those things on the wall behind you? Oh, these. This, uh, I'm on Cortez Island now. And Cortez Island um, is not very big. And 
What else can I say? And it's surrounded by water. And so about <laughs> 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, um, uh, there was no, there were no fish out there. And so uh, when I first came here, like in the 70s, I came here, we fished every night, we ate salmon every night, we had fish all the time, there was fish everywhere. We all had f fishing lures and we knew how to catch fish. And then fish disappeared. I don't, I don't know why. Well, I do know why, but I won't go there. And so everyone dumped their fishing lures at the, um, at the dump. And I went, I get a lot of stuff at the dump. I got those two dolls up there. Um, I get a lot of stuff at the dump. So I went up and there were bags and boxes of people's fishing lures. And um, not only are they beautiful, these are flashers. These go on a line, you're trolling, your boat is uh, underway, it's going forward and you have a, uh, a weight that takes the line down. And then this thing uh, uh, goes back and forth and it attracts salmon. And at the other end, there's a hook. And so I brought them all home. I have a lot of them. Um, I sort of thought it was the end of fishing. And I thought it's the end of this uh, kind of profound thing that I know from being on the coast with sports fishers, that there's like a language. This is the, um, these are the tools for the language to speak to creatures under the surface of the water. Uh, because these were kind of, they were developed by fishermen often, who somehow knew a lot about the response of fish. And so I, I think that they're interesting because they, they were sort of, they are almost an obsolete uh, form of, um, uh, obsolete tool for relationship between humans and animals. So they're fishing, they're fishing, they're flat, they're fishing lure things. That's what they are. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad that the local dump is such a wealth of uh, material and, and thought for you. Uh, so the final question uh, that we're going to ask this evening, and that comes from myself, uh, we're always very curious to share with our viewers what you're working on right now. Okay, so you have a couple of pictures. So these were taken in the studio, I would say in December, just this past December. Um, and this is work that I'm developing now for my next exhibition, which will be in Vancouver at Catriona Jeffries in, in November. Um, and so you can see how I've been using the stuffed animals uh, before. And I noticed um, I was in uh, Whole Foods at Christmas time, and I saw these giant stuffed animals. You might have seen them. This is because Amazon owns Whole Foods, so they're selling everything. They're not just selling food, they're selling big stuffed toys. So I bought some of them. I bought this giraffe, and let's see the next image. I bought a tiger and a lion and a pony, and made molds of them. So there's the tiger. Um, this is a, I'm positioning them now, and I'm putting them in positions of um, of rest or death. I don't know if it's death or rest, but both lying down. And in the next image, in the next slide, um, this is my studio in Vancouver at Parker Street, um, where I do most of the work. So in the next slide, you'll see um, the giraffe that's been cast. The giraffe is at the back sort of gray and it's cast already in rubber and the tiger is half um his mold is half made and i still that might be his top part there uh but i haven't cast him yet i'm just casting him now so i cast them in rubber so that means it's sort of like a rubber membrane and the inside has this stuffing and so they will be um they'll kind of be large versions of those, of the dogs on the boxes. They'll be on platforms, platforms sort of similar to the platform the shoes are on. And they'll be, um, they'll be in a relationship, let's say. They'll be in a relationship to, uh, to you, to the viewer, and also to the um, objects that hold them up. But not a lot, there's a lot more going on that I, I can't talk about because I can't show you and it's premature, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's what I'm working on now. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, Liz. That was just such a wonderful and uh, thorough look at your work and, and particularly placing a, an excellent context on this piece in the collection named Pearl Body. So uh, we're going to wrap up episode four now. I want to send out a few thank yous to the entire team here at the O'Dane Art Museum. Uh, I also want to thank our trustees, our members, and particularly our founder, Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our TNT crew here, our director and producer, Justine Nickel, our quality control uh, coordinator, Erica Chan. Um, I also have a little shout out to the Beacom family on their farm in Ingersoll. Hi. And to you, the viewers, it's such a thrill to have you joining us. Uh, this program is gaining momentum. We've got artists booked through every Tuesday in uh, June. And also um, with some special thanks to Catriona in Vancouver, uh, Susan in Toronto, Isabel in Paris, and Liz in New York. Um, you can get previous episodes of uh, the Tuesday Night Talks at odaneartmuseum.com slash TNT. And for those of you that have been following us, next week is going to be Joseph Tissiga from his apartment in Montreal uh, on June 3rd, and he'll be talking about his piece that has recently come into this collection, uh, Props for Reconciliation, Dilton. And before I go, again, thank you so much, uh, Liz. I'm very envious of where you are there in Cortez Island. And it's just been a wonderful pleasure getting to know you this week and today. Okay, goodbye, Curtis. Goodbye, everybody. Okay, good night, everybody. That's episode four. TNT is a wrap.